People love him already. He's got the uh, Rhode Island twang. The long pass to Moore and a pin block from Martin. Tune in to Cam's corner. <laughs> He's going to make it here. Draws the foul for another Rhode Island in one. I can't his own podcast. It's good off the backboard and in. Trying to break. And we are back, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Cam's Corner, Season 3, Episode 22, Episode 90, just 10 more away. From 100, but today joining me, Brown University and UConn alum and a member of the 2023 MLB Draft, selected by the Boston Red Sox left-handed pitcher, Zach Fogel. Zach, again, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. For sure. And you know, I've seen you've been on a lot of Red Sox podcasts. Um, you know, this one, like I told you, is just going to be like about your journey. Um, obviously, we'll get into some Red Sox questions as well, but I love getting to know like the early stages of the athletes that I talk to. Um you know, where the passion for the game stems from and everything like that. So for you, born in Providence, Rhode Island, grew up in Cumberland, um, you know, your youth days, what did it look like playing ball in Cumberland? And, you know, when did you start to fall in love with the game? Yeah, so Cumberland's a, a very big baseball town. Uh, I think that was kind of inbred in me from a young age. Uh, it was actually funny. I got started in the baseball. Uh, I got forced to by my mom because originally I didn't want to play because I didn't get on my butt, all my buddies' teams. So I was like, oh, I don't want to play on a team by myself. Uh, but my mom forced me to play. I was like, all right, made an all-star team. And I was like, oh, hey, like I'm, I'm pretty good at this thing. And then, you know, just tried out for middle school teams and then into high school. And like with all like the Lily World Series stuff in Cumberland, like it's it's a pretty prominent uh, sport. And and I grew up and just and fell in love with it, uh, fell in love with uh, pitching, especially miss hitting for sure. But those are those are definitely back in my days. Yeah, you talk about making like all-star teams. And of course, it's not only being a pitcher when at that age, but you know, when did you realize you wanted to stick with pitching um, you know, early on in your career? Yeah, I feel like even like throughout my years of high school, I still wanted to hit. Um, I loved playing the field. I was a great outfielder, loved chasing down fly balls, uh, running out there. And uh, but uh my bat wasn't wasn't as great. So as soon as the guy started throwing above like 88 and some 90s started popping up and I was like, all right, I'm all set. Like I'm, I'm happy with hanging up the bat. Um, but like hitting, hitting is a lot of fun. It's definitely very frustrating. Um, pitching is the same way, obviously, but hitting the baseball is a game of failure, you know? So hitting, you say you failed seven times out of 10, you're a hall of famer, you know? So hitting's frustrating and I'm very hard on myself. So giving up hitting was, wasn't that good, but I knew that's why pitching was for me. Uh, I was getting the most looks from it from colleges I'm a lefty, so that's got a little bit of extra taste in there. Uh, but I loved the feeling of striking guys out and watching them walk to the dugout and and just being able to perfect your craft in that kind of manner. It was, it was very appealing to me. So it was more so like at the middle school level, like around like yeah, sixth, seventh middle, grade? Yeah, middle school, more high school uh, probably. But middle school, I was getting like an idea of like, this is what I want to do in Boulder type deal. Yeah, and for, for both of us being from Rhode Island, uh, LaSalle Academy and Bishop Hendrickon are like the powerhouse schools for sports. Um, but you stuck around. You stayed in Cumberland for high school. Was that like an easy decision for you or like you automatically knew like you you just wanted to stay in Cumberland for that time? Yeah, it was actually one of the hardest decisions of my life, to be honest. Um, out of middle school, I went to all the different high schools. Uh, well, I didn't go to Hendrickon, but I went to LaSalle, Bishop Fian, uh and then maybe Moses Brown for like a visit thing, but that wasn't rich. so. It was either Bishop Fian or LaSalle, and then Cumberland, obviously, were my three choices out of middle school. And I decided on either LaSalle or Cumberland. And then I was like, all right, I just want to go to Cumberland. Didn't take the entrance exam or anything. And then all of a sudden in the mail, uh, I got an acceptance letter, and I was like, oh crap, now I have to rethink this whole decision. And then I was like, you know what? I want to go to LaSalle. Like, this seems like a great opportunity. And then the night my mom had to submit the direct deposit, I was like crying to her. I was like, I don't want to go to LaSalle. Like, <laughs> I want to be with all my friends and stuff. So I uh, decided to stay in the hometown. I think that was a really good decision. I met some great people. Uh, coaching staff at, at uh, Cumberland was awesome. Uh, and some lifelong friends from sure. Yeah, and everything happens for a reason. I mean, look at the position you're in now with the Red Sox and uh, your yeah. career is just getting started in the MLB. So, um, like we talked about realizing that jump from like middle school, high school, you know, realizing obviously pitching is going to be like your priority. Um, just talk about like improving as a pitcher, you know, a lot of different positions obviously require different workouts yeah. and things like that. Just talk about like, your routine on like a day-to-day basis and what it was like in high school too, like improving every yeah. day. Yeah. The, 
improving was really big because pitching is like when you're young, you're not that strong. Everyone throws slow. Like there's a couple guys that throw a little bit harder, but like in middle school, everyone's like 70 to like 75, I'd say is like a really good velo in, at that age. So like getting from there to high school, I graduated throwing like 88 or something like that. So like that big jump is really hard to navigate. I feel like for a lot of kids, cause you're getting a lot stronger and you're using all these muscles that you didn't end up using. So that's where a lot of people get injured and stuff. Uh, I was very uh, thankful that I had a, a baseball coach on a summer program, coach Idris, who was super knowledgeable with like throwing programs and strength stuff. So he got me this, uh, to go to the strength facility called Cressy sports performance, which is like super famous baseball uh, workouts. And that got me really knowledgeable uh, about how the body moves and like what muscles I need to work on to throw harder and stuff. So I was very thankful for him and all the stuff he showed me to like get my body ready and, and stuff like that. But like I said, like without that, it's super easy for kids to get injured these days because that's like when you make that jump and you get stronger and your velo starts increasing, that's when you put more stress on your arm and stuff. So that was very uh, cool for me to experience. And then just with the routine is in high school, it's a lot different because most kids still hit. So you, you got to still play the field and stuff. Uh, so that's like a lot of days where your arms hanging, not feeling great because you just threw 80 pitches on a Friday. And then the Saturday game, you got to go play the outfield or first base or shortstop so like that's a thing kids have to deal with in high school but then now is is pretty easy for me uh, I kind of know my routine based on the days that I'm throwing for example like this week I threw in the game uh two days ago and then I know I have a live BP on Friday so like I can kind of tailor my schedule around that I know when my recovery days or like light throwing days are going to be and then I know when I'm going to try to step on the gas pedal a little bit yeah, for sure. And you talked about one of your coaches being like a role model for you too during that high school process and um, wanted to know like outside of him, like who are some other role models like throughout the process that saw potential in you like at a young age? Yeah, I mean, obviously my parents were my biz biggest supporters. Uh, I don't know where I'd be without them. Um, they brought me to all the games, helped pay for all the stuff. Like I can't thank them enough. Uh, from, from the coach's perspective, uh, my middle school coach, uh, where both my middle school coaches who one of them was actually at the high school uh now uh the uh both cardozos they were great for me they kind of really showed me like the passion for baseball how to play the game the right way um and then going into high school we had a great coach uh coach Tukin, and then coach jared was underneath him uh cardozo so like those coaches were great uh coach Idris obviously was was big and then like from a really young age i used to go to uh upper deck baseball academy we used to do camps there and just there were some great coaches there uh, that kind of like got me into the game a little bit. Like there was more fundamental base, but it was like a summer camp. So like you'd go there for like a couple of days during a week and just like play with little kids. And, and that was really fun growing up. That kind of made me fall in love with the game. And then all the coaches after that just kind of solidified the fundamentals and just helped me like grow as a competitor. Yeah. When you realize it too, um, like there's so many different levels to professional baseball one. And there's so many different, obviously for every sport, different schools to go for, um, to make sure your game is showcased at the highest level. So uh, being in Rhode Island, obviously Brown's an Ivy League school. It's a good school for sports in general. But, you know, the decision process comes around your senior year. Um, how did you decide on Brown? Uh, you know, going back to the high school story, you told me, was it an easy decision or was it kind of like, you know, you're already locked in with Brown, you want to stay in Rhode Island? Yeah, so Brown was kind of the first school that offered me my junior year. I went on a visit. Uh, it was a beautiful campus, uh, beautiful field. I uh, had some good talks with the coaches and I think it was just the idea of an Ivy league school. Like I was on this, I was a pretty smart kid. I uh, didn't love school too much, but uh, got some pretty good grades. So I was like, ah, like an Ivy league is just a really good degree. My mom loved it. Uh, the idea, like I honestly at high school level, I didn't really understand the like the level of that degree and like what it would mean for my future. Uh, I just like knew it was like a fancy school to kind of, um, but I jumped on the opportunity. I mean, it's an Ivy League degree is something I couldn't really pass up on. Uh, so that was the first offer I got. And I actually, I took it about a month after uh, during the summer. But it was definitely a tough decision. I talked to a bunch of Northeast schools. because so I kind of wanted to stay in your home, uh, a little bit of a home body. So I, want, I was looking at like, UConn was the, actually the first school that I looked at in high school. That was my first visit. I loved it. Uh, but they didn't want to take a chance on a little kid coming out of high school. So getting a chance to go there out of uh Brown was was awesome.
Yeah, and and similar to that question too, um, you know, with staying with Brown and staying in Rhode Island, uh, we talked about at the high school level talking about like your, you know, improvement process, the routines and things like that. How did you work your way up the depth chart, you know, each year with Brown? You know, for myself, being able to cover Division One baseball, obviously rosters and at the professional level too, they hold a lot of pitchers, of course. But um, you know, what was the hardest part of the process for you to get reps and um, make sure you're getting the the opportunities you deserved? Yeah, I think at the college level. The biggest thing is like you're on your own, obviously, the first time. Right. And I think it's just showing how mature you are as a young freshman. I think that helps you get uh, playing time, showing you know how to play the game the right way. You put effort in the right uh, ways every single day, the best you have uh, at, on that specific day. I think that kind of gives the coaches an idea of how like how you can help the team. Uh, even if it's not ways on the field and then that kind of gets your foot in the door. And then obviously it's just once the competition starts, whether it's in fall ball, uh, your freshman year, getting out there and just showing, showcasing what you got. It's just, it's just a way for the coaches to see how you perform in like a higher level, because like even like everyone in college, especially at the division one level is their best high school players, you know? So when you get to college, it's kind of like, holy crap, like all these kids are just as good as me. So it's kind of a shock at first, but then you kind of get used to it. And that's when like your confidence builds back up and that's when you need to showcase what you got, because that's when all the decisions are made really in the fall is like kind of like a blueprint of what they feel like for the spring. And then when you come back after the winter break, spring season is like super important. And then that like shapes that blueprint to that opening day roster. So Definitely a lot that goes into it to work up that depth chart, but I'd say like showing up every day, giving it all you got is is definitely going to set you up for success. So when was it when you became a starter and how did you feel you were able to be so consistent like year in and year out? Yeah, so for me it's kind of, it's a little bit different because my freshman year, I was a bullpen arm. I got the most innings as a freshman, so that was really cool for me just to kind of get some some borderline experience. And then my sophomore year was the first year of COVID. And then my junior year, the Ivy League banged the next season. So that kind of stunk. So I didn't have my sophomore or junior year. And then my senior year, I was a starter. So that was kind of tough because I didn't really have that like midweek experience like a sophomore or junior would get to kind of get thrown in the mix, but not have that like super heavy role. I went from a little freshman who like got like 25 innings or something, maybe like a couple meaningful innings to Friday guy senior night or, or the first year of the senior season. So that was kind of a learning curve for me, getting that routine back in, um, struggled a little bit at the beginning, but then kind of found my groove at the end, which was nice. It was also, I also got a uh, Tommy John surgery in 2019, right before COVID. So I was also coming off an injury. So a lot of learning curves over, over those, uh, two and a half years of not playing baseball. And then that's that senior year I started needed, like I said, needed to get the routine and then kind of fell in from there. And then when going into UConn, I went back to the pen uh, coming off another injury. And then I kind of fell in love with being in the bullpen again, high leverage situations, one run game, kind of got to shut the door. And, and I, I loved it and I, I still do it today. So. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, what do you think the hardest part of the, the that process was? But, you know, having two years yeah. taken under your belt and then the Tommy John surgery, obviously, that's probably like the biggest thing. But you're granted another year regardless because of the COVID year. Um, you make that transfer to UConn. And that was, like you said, one of the schools or the first school that you wanted to or you seeked interest in, you wanted to go to, um, you know, just run me through that process and how that worked. Yeah, so it was funny. So it's your senior fall is normally when you enter the transfer portal. Uh, so I entered the portal because Ivy League, you can't do grad years there. So like there was no way I could play a fifth year at Brown. Uh, so I knew that was going to be what I needed to do. So I entered the transfer portal. Uh, my Brown coaches were super helpful in the process, helping me like reach out to schools and stuff. But actually, the the day after I entered the portal, uh, Coach Mack, the UConn pitching coach, reached out to me. Uh, and, I, and he was like, hey, like saw you're in the portal, like any interest coming down for a visit? I was like, of course, like I loved UConn from the beginning. Um, so I went and took a visit. I visited some other schools, uh, great schools, but just nothing compared to the UConn facilities. And I was, I committed a week later, uh, to do my grad school there. And, and it was the best decision of my life by far. 
Yeah, senior year at Brown, you killed it. And then, of course, UConn described you as one of their go-to arms, you know, 1.89 ERA, if I'm reading that correctly. Struck out 60 batters, 23 walks, uh, with 23 walks. Um, first team all Big East. You know, what do those accolades mean to you at the end of the day, you know, um, yeah, I, with all that, all the adversity you had to fight through? I think it just shows, like, don't give up. Like, I know it sounds a little cheesy and corny, but, like, there were so many days where I was down in the dumps, whether it was when I was injured or not playing well coming off the injury. And, and, you know, I was just always trying to get a little bit better every day. And I just kind of put my foot down and tried to put one foot in front of the other and, and got through it. And then uh, at UConn, I was super blessed because I had a athletic trainer, Katie Dan, who was so, so good to me and, and uh, really helped me strengthen some areas where I was, I was deficient in. I was kind of causing some of the injuries that I was getting. And then as soon as the the strength in my shoulder got up and I was feeling good, as soon as my arm started feeling good again, it was it was kind of like a switch flipped for me. And I just kind of found a new level of competition that I, I couldn't find before. And just all the success started pouring in. So, I mean, just all those accolades aren't really just me. It's like the people that supported me through that whole process. Mm. Then it was also just like all that hard work, just like kind of finally coming together. And it was just a super amazing feeling. For sure. And not having the traditional path of a, of a college athlete. Again, we talked about the adversity and um, but bouncing back, having all those accolades that we talked about. What do you think your most memorable college baseball story is? Ooh, um, some great memories. Uh, I'd say. Off the baseball field, I'd say playing mafia on the bus with the guys. I mean, we've been on numerous five hour plus bus rides and just that environment, just hanging out with all the guys in, in the, on that bus ride, having some some fun, doing playing games and stuff. It was awesome. On the field, I'd probably say uh, I relieved the game against Butler. I came in in the seventh inning last year, uh, and then I went five in like a third scoreless innings with like one hit. I, like I was just like almost blacked out at that point. Like I was so in the zone. It was crazy. The hardest I've ever thrown. Like I just like was – like as some athletes can describe it. It's like, I don't even remember what happened. Like I would get out of the inning and chuck my, my glove at the wall. Like I was like in another planet at that point, but it was just the most fun I've ever had on a baseball field. And like, that's the funny thing. It's like an athlete, you kind of chase that feeling again. So mm -hmm. like you kind of visualize that every time you go out before another performance and, and it's just a memory that I'll probably have for the rest of my life. Yeah. You talk about off the field as well. And, um, probably your favorite game you've pitched in. What's the worst game you think you've pitched in, like performance wise? Yeah. Uh my senior year at Brown, I pitched against Gardner Webb and I I like had a foot injury or something, like a like a little stress fracture in my foot. And I was trying to like push through it and I just could not throw a strike. I think I had like six walks in an inning. I was like getting blessed. I got like a double play ball to like get out of an inning. And then I tried to go back out there and just couldn't find it. I think I like, I think my final line was like 1.2 innings with like six walks and four runs. I was just like, it was the most frustrating day ever. And that's the thing, like I was talking about earlier with the highs and lows. And it's just baseball is such a sport of failure that you kind of just got to chalk it up learn what fear from your mistakes and just like get back into it the next day and hitting's obviously a lot harder than pitching because you got to do it in the same game whereas pitching you got a little bit of time to reflect but yeah that was that was a tough game for sure definitely and um you know your final year of baseball like we talked about at UConn uh the college level is over you declare for the draft um I actually covered uh this year's draft um I was working at channel 12 in East Providence um and Alex Clemmy uh Hendrickon alum got drafted yeah. to the Cleveland guardians in the second round. Um, we were able to go to his house. So um, I was coming from one of my other jobs. So I met uh, the reporter that I was with and mm -hmm. they had to go to a different um, event. They had to go somewhere else. So they're like, Cam, can you stay at Clemmy's house? And I'm like, I don't know any of these people. It's like, I just met yeah. this kid. Like it was, it was, I was like, yeah, this is insane. This kid's about to get drafted in the second round of the, of the draft. I'll stay. So, um, you know, I'm just sitting in the corner of the room, all this stuff's happening. And obviously like it was a long day cause uh, it was the second round, but um, you know, I'm sitting there with my phone. I have to get a video for the news. Like I have to get all this stuff on and then I have to interview him afterwards. He ended up coming on the podcast. Great kid. But um, you know, for you, like I saw the whole draft process for him, like what it was like that day um, leading up to it. You know, we were, we spent like the whole day with him basically that other half of the day. 
um, just for you, you know, what was it like um, just preparation wise, you know, knowing that you were going to declare and knowing that this could be a possibility? Yeah. I mean, the pressure preparation going into the draft is a lot of, a lot of phone calls with your agent um, and then relaying phone calls from him to from teams and then getting like these questionnaires they give you. Uh, LB does it. They have like this website. It's like prospects. Uh, I'll get these questionnaires on and teams send them. It's like pretty random questions about like general history, health history, family stuff. And then like some weird questions at the end. Um, and then you got to do those. Uh, you have some phone calls. So you, you don't really know what's going to happen on draft day. Like you have a general idea of like what range you're going in. But if, if someone tells you they know what's going on in the draft, they're completely lying to you because it's the most stressful day of everyone's mm -hmm. lives. I feel like, and for me, it was super stressful because I knew I was that day three guy that last day from rounds 10 through 20. Um, so I didn't know I, I had a good chance. I felt like of, of getting picked, but there was still that kind of cloud of in my mind of Holy crap. Like I might not get picked. So it was definitely up and down day, super stressful, but ended up being one of the best days of my life for sure. Yeah, so you found out, I mean, obviously, the, the first day your name wasn't called. Was that when you found out you weren't going to get picked, or was your agent kind of like in your ear, like, all right, it's not going to happen today, but it will happen. Like, it, it, yeah, it's a possibility. Yeah, so for me, since I was a fifth-year grad guy, um, I definitely wasn't going on day one. Um, usually day one is, like, super young stars who are already playing at a super high level that are just, like, the best players in the country that time. Um, and then – kind of seniors and fifth year grad students, they're kind of later in the draft um, because they don't have as much leverage. And like, what I mean by leverage is like uh, a senior in high school or a junior in college, they have leverage because they can say to the MLB, Hey, if you don't give me a lot of money, like I'm just going to go to college or I'm going to play my last year. So they have that kind of statement. Whereas me as a guy with one year left of potential college, I was like, no, I'm going to jump at this bit. So like, that's how like kind of like the draft uh, levels work. So like the day one guys, which is like rounds one and two, like the super high talented young guys. And then day two is uh, three through 10 who are still super high talented guys, uh, younger, some older guys that are just playing out of their mind. And then 10 through 20 is kind of like the older guys that teams know they can grab later on um, because they don't have as that much leverage that I was talking about. So I knew I was going to be that, that last day. And I have no, I was knew that for like a um, couple of weeks, I'd say before the draft. So draft the day one and two of the draft, I kind of was watching, but more just for like to see like how it works rather than to hear my name called. I knew that day three was was going to be my day. Yeah, then that day finally rolls around, and you said like the anticipation is still there because like the later rounds are coming, the picks are coming in. You're like, oh, I might not even hear my name, but you get that call from the Sox. Like, what was that? What was that feeling like? It was. It was honestly the most surreal moment in my life. I feel like it was, I mean, obviously a dream come true playing for your hometown team. Um, and for me, I actually got the phone call from my ex-college teammate, uh, Mark Slouse, who I played with at Brown and now is a scout in the Red Sox department. Uh, so getting the call from him just made it even better. I mean, hearing those words come out of his mouth, like you want to be a Red Sox was just, I instantly was just like, oh my God, this is actually happening. And then seeing my name on the TV was just, it was a dream come true, like I said, but um, that whole process went from the worst day of my life to the best day of my life, kind of gave up. And then the phone call came and I was like, oh, and just like the weight, just the world lifted off my shoulders. It was awesome. Yeah. You talk about like those, those cheesy quotes, but I mean, you really got to do trust the process. Cause like, it's all about patience and uh, seeing how everything unveils. Cause being at Clemmy's house, like that whole process was tough for him. Obviously it was in the second round. So like, uh, yeah. I don't know if he knew he was going to go on the first day, but um, you know, he's, he's, he's been like at MLB prospect camps and all that kind of stuff. Oh, so yeah. he kind of had an idea. Um, but it was, it was, it was crazy. Cause like, he didn't know, like he wasn't getting calls and the, the picks are coming in and in and the day's almost over. It's like 11 o'clock at night. Um, yep. but like, we go back to that, like trusting that process that was back in July. Um, you know, how's it been so far these last few months? Have you had your welcome to the MLB moment yet? You know, when you realize you're a part of the Red Sox, like what was, has anything happened like that yet? Yeah, so I actually had my welcome to the MLB moment last Sunday or this past Sunday, actually. So uh, I got the opportunity to get invited to a big league spring training game, uh, which is just like an opportunity for minor leaguers to go up uh, and showcase what they got and be like in the bullpen for the games. 
So I, I go, I get the call up to go to the big league sprinting game at the Braves facility in Venice, Florida. Um, and I'm on the bus ride there and I'm just like looking at the Braves Instagram. I just, I was just scrolling my phone and I see the lineup for today's game and it's all their starters, Ronald Acuna Jr., Ozzy Albies, Matt Olson, Marcelo Zuno. And I'm like, holy crap, like I'm playing against these guys and we get to the field, I play catch, whatever. Um, and then they do intros. So they do the starting lineups for the Red Sox and the bullpen and the bench players come out. And then I'm I'm out there on the third baseline and they start doing the Braves introductions. And I they I hear Ronald Acuna Jr. over the, the speaker and he walks out in the field and I'm realized I'm standing on the same field as him. I'm like, this is real. Like, holy crap. I'm on the same field as Ronald Acuna Jr. So like that was just a super surreal moment. Um, still haven't faced uh at Ronald. I didn't get to face him that game. Uh, but just like realizing that I'm on the same like field and and this on the same like almost the same level as him was just super surreal. Yeah, we talked about the like the routine in high school, uh, the routine in in the college level. Has anything like really changed? Like, what's the workload been uh, since becoming a Red Sox? Yeah, it's definitely a super high workload, uh, baseball wise, because that's all we do. Um, lots of throwing. Uh, super analytical at the professional level where I didn't get that at the college level. College level is kind of like you got what you got, throw strikes, get outs, win ball games. Like that's kind of how college works. Whereas pro level is more developmental. So they're working all analytics, spin rate, movement profiles on pitches, all this stuff to try to make you a professional, a big league professional baseball player. So like, development is kind of the the key focus at the minor league level um so that kind of influences my routine a little bit different whereas like i'm trying to work on something every day rather than like let's win a ball game type deal so it, it's kind of a it's a little bit different um but yeah the workload's super high i'm throwing six to seven days a week every week uh we have like a velo training program so like that's super high intensity arms definitely hanging a lot of days of the week but I uh, always got to ramp it up quick in, in spring training to get ready for that long season. Yeah. Do you think development has been like the biggest difference you've seen so far? Oh yeah. I mean, there's, you always compete every day. Uh, and like, that's the whole thing of spring training. The minor leagues is you're competing with yourself and all those other players to try to make it on a big league roster. So like, that's kind of the process you've got to have in the mindset that you got to have, that you got to get better every day or else you kind of fall behind a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, just that focus on development rather than kind of winning right in that moment is is, is something to get used to because it's it's a little bit less competitive in some aspects. But at the same time, like everyone wants to be the best player that they can be. So that kind of like promotes some, some competitive nature as well. Definitely. And and before we talked about the, the draft questions, um, I mean, you mentioned a lot that you were a Red Sox fan growing up since a kid, like a big fan. And uh, that first day on the job, you know, you're, you're drafted, all that stuff's taken care of uh, your first day. Did your kind of like, did your childhood really like flash before your eyes and you're like, wow, like I'm a part of the Boston Red Sox. Yeah. I think that kind of moment where I was like, holy, holy crap in my head about <laughs> the Red Sox was not when I got on there at the, the complex the first time last summer, but this spring when I got here and I realized I was in the same dugout as Alex Cora and Jason Veritek. Cause I grew up watching Jason Veritek. I mean, those, that 2004 world series, 2007 world series, like he was the captain of those teams. Like he's my brother's favorite player. So like being able to see him like fist bump him, tell him telling me I threw good in the game. It was like surreal hearing him talk. Um, so I think that was kind of like my Holy crap. I'm on the Red Sox moment. Um, but it's uh, every day. I mean, I see Rafael Devers, Chris and Casas, Brian Bellow pitched in that Braves game that I threw. So like just seeing them every day is, is it just shows how blessed I am to, to do the life I'm living right now. And, and the opportunity that I have uh, to, to work and for this to be my work every day. Yeah, for sure. And, and for somebody like me and uh, people that reach out and they want to talk to you and, and interview you, what's that media attention been like uh, since draft night? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely increased a little bit. Um, get like the Red Sox podcasts and stuff like that. But I love doing like guys from back home, like, like you, uh, some, some uh, reporters. Uh, Cause I mean, it's for like, I kind of want to broadcast my story just for little kids to, to hear, be able to like listen to. And this is like a different side of me that most people don't get to see. 
So just like being able to talk about my experiences for people to learn on is, is I think is super awesome. And I take this opportunity every time I can get. Yeah, for sure. And coming from the smallest state in Rhode Island, um, you know, obviously we talked about Alex Clemmy, but someone like Nick Raposo is from Johnson, like myself, um, went to a division three school, but is still making a name for himself in the MLB. So like nothing is impossible. Again, seeing your guys' journey, it's, it's super surreal. Um, even for myself, not being an athlete, but being in the sports media realm, um, you know, makes it I want to be like that next person up too to be able to make it to the big league, so to speak. But um cool. for like the kids, like you said, watching or anybody who's watching, what's like your um one your word of advice to those those people watching and like your future goals like what's your end game like your end goal as a professional athlete yeah so i'll start with that uh end goal as a professional athlete is obviously being able to step on fenway uh in the big leagues i mean that's been a dream for since i can remember that's being my first dream uh so being able to live out that childhood dream would be amazing uh putting on that uniform walking out and hearing all those fans scream would would be a dream come true for sure. Um, and then a piece of advice I'd give to a little kid or anyone watching this is just put like put in small steps every single day. Like it's it's like we talked about earlier, it's a long journey, it's a long process, and you just got to trust the work you're putting in. Like if if you're doing what you need to be doing, you're gonna have success in this sport or any sport um that you're looking to progress in. And if you if you have that mindset every day of just doing the little things, uh, and, it, and it doesn't have to be, you know, as in baseball sense, it doesn't have to be trying to throw as hard as you can every day. You know, you got to be smart, whether it's, you know, watching an MLB game and just learning or just like getting a little a little workout and stuff like that. Just just little things that helps you get to be a better player every day. And you're going to just build that routine, build that confidence and you're going to have success in anything you do. Yeah, most definitely. And I, I wish you the best of luck in, in your career. I know this is the early stages of it, the very first stages of your career. So I wish you luck in everything um, that comes your way. I appreciate you for hopping on Cam's Corner. And the million-dollar question I always ask every guest at the end is, what would you think of Cam's Corner? I thought it was great. I mean, this is a great podcast. Uh, definitely definitely love helping out the local guys. And I think you guys should all keep listening to all these podcasts for sure. No, I appreciate it, Zach. This is Thank you yeah. for making this episode 90. We're 10 away from 100. So uh, if you're listening on YouTube, watching on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all that stuff, keep tuning in at Cam's One Corner on all social media platforms. And we'll see you guys in the next episode of Cam's Corner.